All right, hello and welcome to our webinar on logic models as a comprehensive tool for t attaining programmatic success. My name is Sarah Lambertson and I'm the Community Food Projects Coordinator for New Entry Sustainable Farming Project. I'll be the host today and our presenters are Craig Lapine and Leslie Heiser from Cultivating Community. I'm going to start with a brief technical overview and let you know a bit about our programs at New Entry and then I'll hand it over to our presenters. So just a quick little bit about New Entry. We are a nonprofit based in Massachusetts, and we do on-the-ground work here in Massachusetts with farmer training and food access. We also have a national presence working to support oh, working to support organizations uh, creating incubator farms as well as interested in applying for the Community Food Projects Grant. So we received a training and technical assistance grant from the USDA to support our work with applicants and grantees of CFP. Um, so we're able to provide webinars such as this um, as well as uh, a lot of resources. So if you go to our website, nesfp.org slash CFP, you'll see a lot of helpful websites and documents. Um, we also do one-on-one -on -one technical assistance. Craig and Leslie, um, through Cultivating Community, are some of our technical assistance providers um, and helping with everything from um, you know, the technical stuff all the way through diving into programmatically um, how to really, the nuts and bolts of, of getting your project up and running. Um, we've got webinars such as this, and uh, my email is there, um, sarah.lambertson at tufts.edu. So at this point, I am going to hand it over to uh, Craig and Leslie, and they are going to begin. Okay, so, uh just enabled our audio. So again, if um, we can get a little confirmation that in fact people can hear us, um, that would probably be helpful. Um, so I'm Craig Lapine. And I'm Leslie Heiser. And I just wanted to say uh, a few things about cultivating community that may help set some uh, context for the examples that we are uh, providing. We, we've been Community Food Projects grantees several times. Um, <clears throat> and um, some of the program work we do includes a farmer training program for uh, new Americans, uh, youth leadership and empowerment programs rooted in sustainable agriculture, um, community garden programs, uh, and food access programs that use a lo local food system approach to creating greater access to healthy diet. So when we uh, we're going through logic models as, as a template, but when we give um, examples of what it might look like on the ground, it will be drawn from our program work. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Leslie, and I want to come clean that I am a fundraiser, and I love logic models for fundraising, um, as well as for other activities, which we'll be talking about shortly. So, um, in thinking about the logic model, it's important to understand that it's visual. It's a picture of how you do your work. And it links the theory and assumptions underlying your program with your activities, outputs, and projected outcomes. Now, what do we mean by theory and assumptions? Those are not usually words that we use at work. Well, what we mean is, here's an example. If we have a community gardening program, and our theory and assumptions is that if we provide non-commercial food growers with land access, with training, and with education, and with help in community development, they will learn to grow their own food, and our community will become more food secure. That's an example of a theory of change. So um, in the RFP for um, community food projects, it, it, it creates a link between logic models and evaluation, and it's true that logic models are good for evaluation. What else are they good for 
Well, the first thing that we want to call out is community development. A logic model process, developing your logic model, is a fantastic way to make sure that your program is including all the people that it needs to include, that, it, that it's reaching out to its stakeholders um, properly. Uh, secondly, a logic model is great for consensus building, both inside your organization and out. An example of inside your organization would be when you identify your output for your program, um, you can take that opportunity to agree with your staff on how many people you will serve, how many people your program managers can reasonably serve. Um, so that's an example of how going through this process can actually uh, create a, an opportunity for you to create important agreements around what you're doing. And so that just kind of blends right in with program planning. Um, you can plan your program as you do your logic model, and it, it really kind of creates an opportunity for you to make sure that you're including everybody that you need to include in the planning process. And, and once that has happened, the logic model can be a really useful tool and should be a living document that helps you check where you are. Um, and I want to come back to uh, a concept that Leslie put out, this theory of change idea, um, and that a logic model can be important for modify, monitoring and modifying how that's going. Um, I'll give you an example from a recent community food project that we completed. Um, we were setting up a series of neighborhood farm stands to create greater uh, access to locally grown food. Um, and we went into the project with a theory um, that the need was greatest in low income neighborhoods and that that would create a multiple benefits. It would create more access for people who were buying local food with SNAP and WIC and other federal nutrition benefits. And as I mentioned before, we run a farmer training program and we're very interested in building farmer income and that those farm stands would create, those farm stands located in low income neighborhoods would create a strong income stream for the farmers. Um, in fact, uh, after year one, we realized that um, it was really mixed, um, a mixed model where, uh, where farm stands were located in more mixed neighborhoods it still provided a lot of access. There was still a lot of WIC and SNAP redemption, um, but they were actually busier if they weren't um, located solely in low-income neighborhoods, but they were located in sort of these um, edge neighborhoods around Portland where di people of different income groups were coming together, and those, you know, those just proved better for the customers and better for the farmers. So we learned a lot, and the logic model kind of gave us a, a tool to refer back to and to shift direction. And where in Portland, Maine, by the way. Yes, very important. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so again, and, and uh, I think the Community Food Projects RFP really stresses the connection between logic models, um, and that is true, um, but it's because of this ability to really uh, lay out what your plan is with, within your organization, in the community, test it with people, and then have an ability to, to see whether you're on track. And, and, the, and I think the concrete items here to understand around, around how the logic model grounds program evaluation is it forces you to identify your outputs, to commit to outcomes for participants, and to think about the community impact that you want to have. Um, and I, we forgot to mention at the beginning, but uh, Sarah sent out a couple of emails encouraging people to print out uh, slide 11 from our presentation, which has a sample logic model. And we're banding around terms like uh, your outputs, your impacts. Um, those are the categories of the logic model. So it probably would be helpful if you haven't already done it to, um, to, to, to print that out so you can follow along. Because we we're, we're going to use those terms and then at one point in the presentation actually show you how we build one of these things. So the last item that Craig just pulled up is that a logic model is good for providing a foundation for publicizing program achievements in a really, really substantive way. 
Um, it helps you to tell the story of your program in terms of what was actually achieved and the community impact that you're moving towards. Ah, last one, providing a baseline for your next program model. Let's say that you're entering into um, year three of your community food project. It's time to go back to your logic model and start to evaluate among your stakeholders how this program is going. Is the theory of change holding up? Were the outputs that you committed to reasonable? Are you sort of in the target zone for your outcomes? And do you still see that through line to the community impact, that the long-term outcomes that you had projected? Does that story, does that narrative arc still seem to be working for you? If not, you can start to think about tweaking your model. So um, the principal strength of, lo of the logic model development process. Logic models support an inclusive process. They encourage you to recognize all your stakeholders to involve them in the creation, development, and evaluation of your program, and to forge a program model that, in being responsive and accountable to your stakeholders, is a persuasive tool for fundraising and, more importantly, is likely to be successful. Um, and I'll just provide a, a quick example. Um, there are a lot of uh, folks who have been resettled in Maine, uh, former refugees uh, who have been resettled in Maine. Many communities are interested in agriculture. We are one uh, organization that is supporting uh, new Americans who want to farm in Maine. There are others, many of them based in the communities uh, of the immigrants and refugees themselves. Um, so we were we were exploring what we thought was useful to to build the farmer base to build our our community of beginning farmers from this pool of new Americans. Um, but it was really important for us uh, recently to pull together a meeting of all of the all of the folks who are providing services to we say new Mainers or new Americans um, in agriculture. Um, and it really helped move the conversation from one, I think, of perceived competition to understanding where, um, where the synergies were and what are the specific strengths that each service provider had so that we could, um, so we could map out a program that really leveraged people's strengths. And I'll add to that by saying it's really important, though, to go the next level out and to understand that that you don't want to just collaborate with program partners in other organizations. That's not what we mean by inclusive. Inclusive is when you go way out there and you reach out to your other stakeholders, to your participants, to your constituents, to the people that, that we're all presuming that we benefit. And um, especially when you are dealing with people, I'm sorry, especially when you're collaborating with people who are dealing with um, social discrimination, racial discrimination, it takes a really conscious effort to reach out to people and to integrate them into your uh, logic model development process. But you definitely do want to do that. So. So oh, developing a logic model develops consciousness. You know, we all implement these programs, but there can be a degree of unconsciousness that can really sabotage the program. If you do a logic model process, though, it's an opportunity to consciously chart your course, to create an explicit understanding of your challenges, the resources available, and the timetable, and to gain a balanced, integrated, shared perspective on the big picture and the component parts. And so, uh, just to underscore this, what we're really talking about is not the document, um, but the process that creating a document like this, sort of the, the discipline that it puts you through uh, in terms of connecting to constituents, connecting to stakeholders. Um, so, what, we just want to flag some mistakes that can be avoided that we would encourage you to avoid. It really is a process that gets really at the root of your work and at the even at the organizational culture. So it's not something that someone can go into his or her office and close the door and do 
on their own. It really needs to be collective or it's not going to be a, a useful process. You can't hand it off to an outside fundraiser or a consultant. It really, uh, I think the people uh, who are experiencing the problem that is trying to be solved and the people who are trying to gather the resources to solve that problem need to be in the room talking to really create a useful uh, logic model. Yeah, so, and the second one is just what Craig said, exactly what he said, and understanding that a staff-driven process, even if you include your whole staff, is still a narrowly grounded process and something that you want to open up. Um, and so while, you know, and I think it was, I think many people may be on the call because they're interested in community food projects. Community food projects do stress it as a as an evaluation tool, and we've said this before. It's great for that, um, but it really can drive the life of an entire project um, from planning through evaluation. So now what we're going to do is we're going to, over a couple slides, talk about the core components of the of, of our logic model, and we want to be really honest with you and tell you that this is what we do, and uh, it worked for us. Um, so first we're going to talk about them generally, and then we're going to talk about them in by referring to one specific element of our um, re recent CFP application. So, so as you probably know, a logic model is read from left to right, and it's, it's read with an if-then model. In other words, if you have the first item, which is certain resources and certain challenges, and you, and you have certain objectives that you want to accomplish, and you engage in certain activities, and you deliver certain outputs, and those outputs generate certain kinds of outcomes for participants, then you will be working towards a community impact in the long term. Grant reviewers attest that the biggest weakness of applications is the lack of a solid description of how programs will demonstrate their effectiveness. It's really important to understand that, that the real measure of effectiveness is the outcomes for your individual participants, which are going to be demonstrated in terms of your selected metrics. And, and those metrics could be an increase in skill, a change in attitude, a change in a certain aspect of a person's well-being, all kinds of things that they, they should, um, they should relate to the, the person who's participating in the program. It's crucial that you're clear on the difference between outputs and outcomes before writing a grant application. Here's some examples. An output is the number of farmers that are in, enrolled in a training program, but an outcome is an increase in farmer skill or in farmer income. An output is the number of food preparation models that your organization might have delivered, but the outcome is the number of teens participating in your program whose skills and consumption of fruits and vegetables have increased. Outputs are what your organization does. Outcomes are changes for participants. Um, and, and I will say that we, as much as anybody, fall into the trap. It's, it's a lot easier for us to measure our outputs. Um, but if you're A, if what the funders care about, and B, if you're really trying to change the world, you really have to have an outcome focus uh, and not just focus on your own activity. Yeah, because that's where you say that you're really going to make a difference is around your outcomes. Um, so, I'm going to walk through a sample, sort of a simplified version of a, of a logic model that we actually um, developed. Um, and it starts on the left, uh, the project focus, which in this case was community gardening and non-commercial food production. Um, 
it, it may seem a little bit backwards, but I think it's, it's important to remember uh, that for most of us, our organizations don't do everything. And so there are probably problems out there um, where the solution uh, is going to be a midnight basketball league, or the solution is going to be, you know, building a new food storage facility. Those don't happen to be things that we do, and so we're not going to, we may see that as a solution, but we're not going to engage in that project, and we may try to share that with somebody else. Um, but then, as Leslie said, we try to take a look, and we try to do this in conversation with others, uh, at what the situation is in our community. So one of the things um, that was coming to us in our work was that there was a strong desire in our community to grow food, um, and that we, in particular, had strong relationships uh, with government, with schools, with community, and we thought that those were relationships that we could leverage in service of this broadly expressed desire of people to be growing more of their own food. Um, we were also coming from a place where uh, we had high levels of food insecurity um, that were directly linked to challenges to healthy food access, um, that people who wanted to grow their own food were having a hard time finding the land to do that. And because of our uh, our situation as a refugee resettlement community um, and, and the site of kind of a, um, a historical farming culture that is very much in transmit uh, that is in transition that kind of historical ways of growing food knowledge are are being threatened right now and so we're looking at ways to perhaps repair that so that that is the situation on the ground um, so what is it that we were trying to do we think it's important, and in conversation with our partners, and in by living in and being engaged in the community, are important to develop uh, engaged communities of food growers. Um, we thought shifting the culture in the community gardens would be important for creating more access. Um, that that there was a need for garden education because of that patchy intergenerational transmission at this particular, you know, moment in time, um, and uh, that we could partner with other groups uh, who and support other groups who are out trying to create this land access. All right, so that's our situation. Um, those are some of our objectives. What activities, as, as Leslie said, it's an if-then model, um, what activities would help advance that? Well, um, we're going to try to establish some new gardens in partnership with other community groups. We are going to um, let people who self-identify as leaders um, try to support them with uh, leadership development and resources so that they can pull their own growing spaces together. Um, and we're going to produce a more broad-based education series that will help people grow their own food. Coming back to this distinction between outputs and outcomes and impacts, so the outputs um, are the, the much easier to measure things. We're going to try to get 446 community gardens gardeners in 13 gardens by 2018. Um, we are going to get 200 people to you know, attend a workshop. Uh, we will identify 25 community leaders who want, uh, who want to gain access to land and to farm. And one thing that is helpful to me is remember that um, when we're talking about outputs, what we're often doing is we're committing to the scale of our efforts. Right. Um, so this is the outputs, and just to, you know, go back, these are, these are the two categories that I was really stressing a moment ago. Um, uh, the outputs are the stuff that that we are committing to do, but the outcomes are the changes 
in the community, in among participants, the real change that people will experience. So the hope is that coming out of that garden, all of those gardens, all of those gardeners, that leadership support, that community education will be that a high percentage of our community gardeners will report an increased quality or quantity of production, connectedness, self-efficacy and well-being, um, and that 80% of first and second year gardeners will report increased consumption of fruits and vegetables. So to get back to um, outputs versus outcomes piece, we're doing something, but that's going to result in a change for participants. Impacts can be a little elusive, I, I think. Um, a community food project grant, if that's your focus right now, is at most four years. Um, impacts take a little bit longer to emerge. Yeah, a lot of times um, people will talk about impacts taking seven to ten years. So that would always be outside of the particular project, probably. Um, but I think it's really important, and we'll get to this in a, in a, in a few slides, I often think it's important to talk about the think about the impacts first when when one is engaging in a conversation uh, with with staff with community partners when just thinking about it to me the question is how do we want the world to be different um, right and and I'll add to that too that there should be a really strong connection between the impacts that you come up with and your organizational mission statement. So, so once again, um, just to stress that this is a process and not a document, and that we, we really love the process and encourage you to try it um, because it can provide a lot of these benefits. So it brings people together by creating consensus on the needs in our community, our strengths, our challenges, what specifically we seek to accomplish with a particular program, what we have the time and the resources to do, how many people we can reasonably serve, what we can deliver to them, and by when. The best ways to measure our outcomes. The community impacts we, in partnership with others, aspire to create. All this can be clarified in a logic model development process. And, and it, by vetting that thoroughly um, inside and outside the organization with individuals, with people experiencing the issues um, with other organizations, um, really can create a much stronger project. And now we've arrived at um, something that's a little bit more of an intermediate or advanced topic. But there are three ways that you can approach a logic model, which really means there's three different areas of emphasis that you can have. And um, this is discussed pretty fully in the Kellogg Foundation document that I um, that I gave you that that Sarah provided information on. This is just available on the web. It's called a Kellogg Foundation Logic Model Handbook, and it's really how I educated myself a few years ago about, about doing these uh, models. But um, sometimes you, you create a model where what you really want to emphasize is the theory-based approach, your theory of change. So that kind of model really emphasizes big picture thoughts and ideas. It emphasizes the theory of change, the if-then approach that has shaped the concept for this particular program. It illustrates how and why you think your program will work. And it's most useful early on during program planning and design, and it's very useful for making the case in grant proposals. You know how um, you always have to write some kind of statement of need or something? And um, I find that the logic model development process and coming up with the community challenges um, that you come up with in the very beginning, um, that feeds right into writing a good, strong statement of need in a proposal. So 
if you're having trouble starting a theory-based model, I would encourage you to think to, to plan backwards. Uh, and again, um, you know, to really root yourself, and again, not in an isolated inter-organizational way, but in a broad conversation with the community, what exact, what is it that, um, the, what is the world that we are trying to create? And those are the impacts. So just, just came up with some examples, but if the world we're trying to create has very low rates of food insecurity um, and very high farmer incomes, let's say, or relatively high farmer incomes, that's the world that we're trying to create. And I want to just add to that that I think it's okay if your impacts do not have a quantitative aspect. Um, you know, if you uh, if you talk about things like um, creating a more um, strongly connected community, that's just an example. Things that are very hard to measure, I think that's also okay for impacts. And then over on the left-hand side of your logic model is the world that we have now, which is the resources and challenges. Um, and so, for example, you're in Portland, vibrant farmer's market but doesn't accept staff, for example, or uh, a committed economic development team. Those may be conditions that exist on the job, uh, on the ground now. And then the whole project is what are those if-then steps that take you from the world that we live in now to the world that we're trying to create. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the next type. And by the way, this might sound daunting, but I think it's great if you actually create all three kinds of models for one particular program. When you're planning and when you're doing your grant writing, you do the theory of change, then you get the money. Fantastic, congratulations you can develop your model a little bit more so that it includes an activity-based emphasis. And this focuses on how the program will be done. It expresses how the program activities work together and maps out the implementation process. And it provides detailed steps that the organization needs to follow. It's most useful for program monitoring and management. Now notice, that if you involved all of your staff in a logic model development process, when you get the money and it's time to implement, all these people have bought into this program that they now are responsible for implementing. So you're in a much stronger position than if you were just introducing all these new requirements to your staff. Okay, the third type of model is an outcome-based model. This connects the activities with the desired results, which would be the outcome and the impact. By the way, I should mention that a lot of times outcomes can be split into two, one to three years and four to six years, and then as I mentioned, impacts are seven to 10. Oh yeah, that's what it says there, okay. <laughs> the theory of change is not really emphasized in this particular approach. And it's most useful in designing effective evaluation programs and in sourcing the dissemination of results and publicity. Now, if you have a big organization and you're doing a lot of PR and you have a lot of colleagues who are going out and talking to magazines and newspapers and bloggers and radio stations and goodness knows who else, you know, if you want to discipline that process a little bit as an executive director, you can ask them to please speak from the logic model and focus on the specifics of your program. And by the way, if you want to read up more on this, uh, I believe it's pages 9 uh, through 13 of the handbook that discusses these three approaches. And so that is our last slide. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing the document, and um, if Sarah wants to take back the hosting, we will switch to question and answer mode. All right, so first off, I just want to say a huge thank you to Craig and Leslie. Um, 
for their knowledge and for walking us through that. So at this point, um, we're happy to take any questions that you have. Um, probably the best way to do it is if you just type your questions into the chat box, um, and it's easiest if you send them to everyone. So that way we sort of limit the duplication, and Craig and Leslie and I can all read them and make sure it makes sense uh, who should answer them. So feel free to start typing. All right, so first question is, what is the difference between objectives and goals? You know, is it Mike, can I speak? Sure, go ahead. Okay, we really struggle with that too. And, um, you know, with all due respect to the USDA, we've noticed in a couple of their application formats that um, there are times when we have to do objectives and goals for the activities table, and we have to do them also in the narrative, and they seem to be asking for slightly different things. I think that an objective is larger than a goal. Um, an objective is less concrete than a goal. Actually, um, if you read the Kellogg Foundation handbook, they don't include objectives in their logic modeling for the most part, but we include it in ours because, because when we're doing a logic model, we are also writing a grant application, and we think it's so important to be clear about the program objectives and to sort of uh, integrate them in with everything else so that we're not fuzzy on those. But I agree with you, Patricia, that um, it's not always easy to be clear about that difference. And I think that when you look at different applications um, and, and different RFPs, you should be open to sort of rethinking the difference between objectives and goals in the context of that particular RFP, because I don't think those definitions are totally stable. What do you think, Craig? Yeah, I, I agree, and I and I don't want to lead anyone down the wrong path, but I would say that we have had, um, we have not been penalized, and we have had success when we have have taken um, the language from an RFP or the categories of an RFP and bent them more to the categories that are useful to us. Um, and so, if they're asking for goals and objectives, but really um, we're focused on a, you know, we're calling all of those things objectives. Um, we've done that, and have, yeah, as I said, haven't been penalized for that. And um, if you look at the objectives that we have on on the community gardening band of our logic model that we provided you with, none of them is quantifiable. Whereas I think that if we were getting into goals, we would be more we would be moving more into quantifiable language as opposed to qualitative language. I hope that's helpful, Patricia. All right. So if there are any other questions, please feel free. Um, so just clarifying more closely related to impact. Is Patricia? Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I agree with that. I think they are more closely related to impact, whereas goals are things that you can commit to and being held accountable to. But like if you look at our top objective on our band, develop engaged communities of growers, I mean, geez, that would be almost impossible to measure. So it's an objective. <laughs> Um, I've got another question here about the different types of grants you can apply for. Um, and I guess, uh, Craig and Leslie, I don't know if you want to share some of the grants you um, you do apply for, but I think really this this model, logic model, um, is, is widely used for most types of USDA grants, and I wouldn't be surprised if foundation grants as well. But uh, Craig and Leslie, do you have uh, more specific information on that? Well, we we just 
you know, for me, like when we ha when we quote unquote have to do one of these, it's a great opportunity to do something that can help me over and over and over and over again. And it's not it's not just for private foundations that require it. It's it's that um, it's just that the the information the 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 things that we define when we do this process can just be repeated out over and, and over and over again or, or with a slightly different emphasis or whatever a particular foundation is interested in. Yeah, and it really for us becomes, um, we don't do sort of big organization-wide strategic planning all that often. Um, so this is a tool for really doing program-based strategic planning, um, which then does, yeah, we, we just find multiple uses and um, whether a funder, federal or private, has requested one or not, um, that they're very useful tool, tools. And uh, we were just asked if we would share the PowerPoint after this webinar, and if we mind, you know, if you, if we mind, if other people share it, and we don't, um, we created this to be helpful to you and to be a resource for everybody. Yes. One thing that I want to caution you against, of course, is like identifying different outcomes, for example, for different grant applications. That would be a nightmare. If you're writing a big grant like CSP, what you want to do is try to come up with with outputs and outcomes and impacts that that actually can go into all of your proposals or many of your proposals, and you you don't want to modify the portion of of or the, the numerical aspects for a different foundation because that would be so hard to keep track of and it would be hard on your program managers. So there was just another question that uh, came in saying in the Kellogg guide example, their first column is inputs. What column would this be in the speaker's example? Um, I believe, Craig and Leslie, it would be your resources, but uh, is that correct? Right. Well, well, we have them identified as situation. Right. Uh, okay. So assets and challenges. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah. So if you have a question about inputs, what they're really thinking of is what can you sort of bring to the table to get this done. So they're thinking of it in a really positive way. Uh, what are the human resources that you can bring to a certain problem? What are the assets that you have? Do you have a farm? Do you have a farmer's market location? Um, what, are, what, what kind of relationships in the community can you bring to this project? So anything that you start out with is what they're interested in. But we also like to quantify, not quantify, but, but um, we, want, we like to state the problems and the challenges um, because we feel like that's really organic to the program model too. And that keeps us really focused on what is it that we're trying to transcend here? What is it that we're trying to get beyond? So I've got a, a question for you, Craig and Leslie. Um, how long does it typically take for you to put one of these together, considering that you're not just engaging your staff, but you're engaging um, your external stakeholders and your beneficiaries of the project? So what's sort of a, a sense of how long it would take to put this together? Well, here's my recommendation, and, and then we'll see what Craig thinks. I think that the stakeholder outreach should be conducted all the time, year round, on a periodic basis, so that you don't, you know, you don't want to convene people for the first time, it seems to me, unless you can help it, for a logic model development process. Um, you want to get in the habit as an organization of doing that as an aspect of ensuring your program quality and your program relevance. So if you've been doing that, if you've been getting input from the community, um, it, it may be possible to integrate some people into your logic model development process without creating this enormous uh, structure for doing so. But I would say for us, because we've done a few of these together, um, that it takes a couple of weeks. And for us, the most intensive part 
I would say in all honesty, is the staff part with the staff to some degree representing their stakeholders, representing their constituents, and also the staff asserting what it is that they can do. Um, so. Great. So we have another question here um, that's a clarification. Horizontal bands across columns don't necessarily have to relate directly to each other. It is just if then and reading the whole column before moving on to the next column and asking if that is correct. Not necessarily following one objective across each horizontal axis. Um, and, I, and I responded to Jessica's question in the chat box as well. Oh, sorry about say, that. No, that's fine. But I, I would say um, that that's a little bit of a vestigial structure for us in that we often do, and this example comes out of a logic model that was actually developed for multiple programs. And the community gardening and non-commercial food production band um, was just one of the programmatic areas. So in this case, Jessica's absolutely right. Everything kind of mixes and matches, and there's not necessarily a, a through shot um, between the first, like say, the first blurb in each column. Um, However, we did have other sort of horizontal columns below that, uh, sorry, horizontal bands below that, that were, you know, contained within themselves, but this still um, was that if-then model. And some activities do span program areas for us. The one that I've noticed is really not um, sequentially related to the others is the situation where um, what we actually do is we list the apps. Like for CFP, we have a bunch of different programs that we integrate into our CFP. So the assets would be assets for all of those programs, and the challenges would be assets for, I mean, sorry, the challenges would be challenges for all those programs, kind of mixed up in a way, because we're talking about a very, very qualitative thing. But um, I think Craig is right that, that you do move from, left to right in a more deliberate, directed, sequential way outside of the situation column. Would you say that's right? Um, I would say that that's true, although it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship mm -hmm. from objectives to activities and activities to outputs. I would say everything in the objectives column then suggests the activities, and all of the activities lead to outputs, and it may not be a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one relationship. I got it. And and would you say that that's true inside a particular activity band, like here, community gardening? Yeah. That's what you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. All right, so we had another question come in. Um, do you have any recommendations for mid-level project or organizational staff for whom support or buy-in for creating logic models is not present at the top levels of a project or organization, or perhaps suggestions for garnering buy-ins from the top? We can consult with you, because <laughs> we are really true believers. Um, I, I think make, what I, I think what happened at our organization was um, I had sort of fallen in love in this really nerdy way with the Kellogg Foundation handbook and had read it like ten times before I started my job. And um, of course, I saw the references to logic modeling um, in the RFPs from the USDA. And um, I, I know Craig had done some logic modeling already as well, but I think it was a confluence of, of him having some experience in that, knowing that um, it was an asset as far as the USDA is concerned. And then I was being kind of a true believer and really thinking that if we started to do this, it could ground all of our fundraising and be helpful to everybody else on staff. So I think you, you need somebody who can send that message because, sure, on the face of it, it looks like a pain. Um, of course, when you start to see all the grants coming in because you have an excellent logical model, uh, then it looks pretty good. So, so, so um, I think you need people to advocate for the process. And, and I would frame it uh, in a slightly different way as well, which is, um, you know, the, the logic model is a tool, but what is the problem that you might be trying to solve? I know. Um, it is, and I may have said this earlier, you know, that, that it, it is a common criticism uh, lodged at 
nonprofit organizations that they may be, um, as, the, as the jargon goes, community placed, not community based. That it is, you know, sort of parachuting in some kind of solution. Um, so if your organization thinks that's a problem, what I would say is the logic model is a tool for addressing that problem. If your organization doesn't think it's a problem, then then that's then I think that's really the issue there, <laughs> you know. And so I don't know how to move the culture toward that. Um, and if that's not an issue, if if you're in your community, if your organization is fully integrated with the community, um, and and uh, people who are experiencing the problems that you're trying to solve are in leadership positions, um, then maybe the, then this is one tool and maybe you don't even need it. Um, but that is that is how it has been helpful to us. So, so here's another question from Patricia. So ideally would one do an overall program logic model as a strategic planning process, then draw from that for individual grant requests could cover a program within a department and or overall department objectives? I would say absolutely. That's, that's exactly um, sort of what we were getting at before when we say when we develop these and then really return to this well over and over again because that is the function that it has served. It has it is thoroughly vetted where what we think the situation is, where we'd like to go, um, who our partners and constituents uh, what they think the situation is and where they would like to go. And so, yeah, it absolutely can serve as a, as a roadmap for that. You know, um, I'm not sure if Craig will agree with this, but um, I think one good thing about maybe, like, not doing strategic planning and doing logic model development process is that there is a time constraint, and sometimes when we do strategic planning, we get really bogged down. And I have found that doing this particular process within a certain time frame is a way to still bring people together in an excellent and substantive way, but you don't need to pay for a bunch of consultants, and people do not get bogged down. I do agree. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. These are great questions coming in from everyone. We'll um, not sure if we have any more questions. We've got a little more time if anyone uh, would like to, would like to write them in. Um, I also want to encourage you if there's things that come up later on for you, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, our contact information is here. And um, also, if you're interested in uh, maybe you already are a CFP grantee and you're thinking about uh, another one and, and really want to implement this process or um, thinking about an application, I really encourage you to take a look at our website and to um, to see our resources there and to get assistance from us um, because we really can give you some support and Craig and Leslie are great resources uh, clearly for this. Looks like we've got one more question that just came in. Um, can your project's logic model impact be different than your organizational logic model impacts, or should the impacts always reflect the overall organizational organization's desired impacts? Yeah. I think that they would be, you know, practically the same because um, if you're talking about something that's achieved over a seven to ten year period, it's going to take so much effort to move towards that um, that it's going to take an entire organizational commitment. So. Um, I mean, they should, at the very least, be highly, highly compatible. And then here's the last question. How do you become a CFP grantee? Well, Sarah's really the expert on that. Um, so <laughs> why don't I let Sarah speak to that? Uh, sure. So the, the Community Food Projects grant is run through NIFA through the USDA, um, and it's a competitive grant program. They have a um, request for applications that gets released each fiscal year. The most recent one was released in February and it closed in March, so um, you're not able to apply at this point for it, but some point in the next several months, um, could be this fall, this winter, this spring, the next round of application uh, requests for applications will be released. and. Um, um, so it's, you submit an application. It's a pretty involved application. 
Um, and I definitely would encourage you, if it's something you're thinking about, to take a look at the RFA now from last year. Um, it will likely change a little bit, but I don't imagine that it will change in any real substantive way. So I would encourage you to take a look at it from last year and start to wrap your head around it and start to think about what project you want to do because a real fundamental component of this particular grant program is the community engagement piece. So this logic model process could be a great way to really be engaging your community in the in the development of a project so that by the time the application, the request for applications is released, um, you're already, you're already, you know, in the midst of planning with your community. Um, last time the application period was just over four weeks, which is incredibly short for a grant of this size. So it's really best to be prepared um, and thinking about that beforehand. And Again, if you want to reach out to me individually to speak with me more about the grant program, please feel free. Um, I'm more than happy to do that. And we can add you to an outreach list to let you know when the application is, when the RFA is released. Um, so I don't know if you're looking for more information, but that's sort of the, the quick rundown. I would just really underscore a couple things that, that Sarah said. In my experience, the, the language in the request for proposals, um, you know, it's largely dictated by the legislation that created the program. So it really doesn't change a lot from year to year. There are a couple of minor tweaks, um, but I think you could safely look at the 2015 RFP and start a planning process. And, and if you're, you know, there is a bit of a paradox that the USDA wants um, a lot of community engagement and in the most recent grant cycle um, allowed four weeks between the release of the RFP and the due date. Um, so really, just, just to reiterate what Sarah said, I, I think it, it will not harm you at all to start work thinking about it now, thinking about who you want to bring to the table. Um, and our experience is, is that that effort is not is not, never wasted. Sometimes we get USDA grants, sometimes we don't, but the planning that the process leads you through um, is, is we, we always can then leverage that for, for further work. Yeah, and I mean, what, one specific example that you might want to consider is forming community-based leadership groups um, in your areas of intended activity. So if you are working in community gardens, do you have a gardener leadership group? If you are working with farmers, do you have a farmer leadership group? If you are working in food access, do you have a representative group of people who are affiliated with your organization who convene with you sometimes and who can speak to food access issues in your community? When if you if you go to the trouble of forming groups like that, you can list them in your CSP application, and furthermore, they'll totally ground your whole process, as Craig said. All right, um, Patricia is just agreeing that it really does, um, it pays to start working towards it early. Um, it, is, it is a lot of, it is a big project, so um, a, big, a big application, so I really let us support you in any way that we can. Um, so I think at this point, unless there are any final questions that come in, uh, we might wrap up. Uh, I will be sending out a recording of the webinar in the next day or so. Um, I'll also have a feedback form in there. We really appreciate any feedback that you have. Um, so if there's anything, any thoughts that you had, we'd love to hear it. And I just want to thank both Craig and Leslie for doing a great job presenting and also all of the attendees. Thank you for being here with us today and thank you for your questions um, and your engagement. We really appreciate it. And uh, I think no more questions have come in, so I really appreciate it. We're going to wrap it up right there. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs>